Uh, today, most of the people that are in the session are going to talk about tools for looking at what's happening in the brain. And those tools that have been developed, like functional magnetic resonance imaging, allow us to look deeper in the brain at a faster temporal resolution on the order of seconds and a better spatial resolution on the order of millimeters, which allows us to ask, I think, uh, questions that are relevant not only to what's going into the brain and what's coming out, but what's happening in between. Complex cognitive processes, some approaching compassion. Um, I, we were asked to say something personal about why we're here. So um, uh, I am here. I, 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 actually, scientists find this very uh, disturbing, I think, you know, because everything's very multi-causal, so how can you pin it down? But I, I think I can blame at least two people in this room for why I'm here. Um, the first uh, I met in 2000 at a conference in uh, Dharamsala. Uh, my, my then girlfriend, now wife, was speaking at that conference, and I had a better time than she did. Uh, because she was thinking about her talk, and I got to hang out with all the cool, interesting people there, including some amazing Buddhist scholars. Uh, and this is one of them that I met then, Tapton Jinpa. Uh, being at that conference made me realize that there could, there could be an intelligent um, dialogue between uh, Buddhism and science. Um, the second uh, person I met over a decade later, um, basically His Holiness had come to Stanford to talk. Uh, this charismatic neurosurgeon was trying to convince me that we should get this guy back and, you know, maybe do some science in the interim. Um, and I, being the young uh, tenure-seeking faculty, was reluctant <laughs> to get involved. But, you know, he really made an offer I couldn't refuse. He said, my partner in crime is this really great Buddhist scholar, um, Tupton Jinfa. So I said, okay, here, I'm, I'm, I'm in. Uh, and I've been ever, in ever since. Uh, so thanks uh, to Jinpa and Jim for allowing me to be here. Thank you very much. I also uh, wanted to lay some groundwork, so I wanted to talk a, a little bit about the brain and about how one might think about the brain in relation to something so complex as compassion. And I think it was Joel yesterday who said, neuroscience is really tough, the brain is very complex, and he's right. And one strategy we often use for understanding the brain is to break things down into components and try to get at those components. Um, and this is not actually so different from what I've heard about how uh, Buddhist meditators or even... Um, philosophers think about mental phenomena, that they try to systematically break them down into components and understand how those components fit together, how they, uh, one arises upon the other. So as an example of this, I'm going to bring up Jinpa's example um, from two days ago about compassion. So there's some components of compassion, and they include uh, cultivating a sense of concern for another, um, appreciating their suffering, and wishing for them to be free of suffering. So to give you an example of trying to take these components and put them in a neuroscience package, um, I've been fortunate enough to collaborate with Jinpa and others in my lab on a very simple task in which we actually ask people to do this. We say we would like you to extend compassion uh, or no particular feeling to a neutral person that you're going to see, a stranger. Uh, and this is how each trial works as people are being scanned with functional magnetic resonance imaging. So they see a cue. The cue they know indicates that they're supposed to extend compassion to the upcoming person. They see a face for six seconds, not very long at all. Then they're asked to rate how well they thought they did in extending compassion or neutrality to the person, and then they go to the next trial. And this is repeated over and over. Now you might think, wow, you know, this, in, in undergrads doing this kind of abstract task, what's going to happen? Is it going to be intelligible at all? Um, so given those components that I just mentioned, we can actually make hypotheses. So um, I, I talked about cultivating a sense of concern or identity with another person, appreciating their suffering, and wishing for them to be free of suffering. Well, as a neuroscientist, what we've learned in the last 10 years is that there are some activation patterns that are associated with these kinds of phenomena. For instance, uh, cultivating a sense of concern or identity with another person has been shown to activate regions including the medial prefrontal cortex on the left. And there's also a possibility it might activate other uh, circuits associated with reward, maybe more subcortical circuits. We don't really know, and Jinpa raises a question, such as the nucleus accumbens. You'll probably hear more about that today. You heard about it in Joel's talk. Uh, appreciating their suffering may engage parts of the brain that we've seen when people anticipate pain or bad things happening, if, if you're really actually feeling what other people are feeling. Areas like the amygdala and the anterior insula. And wishing for them to be free from suffering may activate more motor preparation areas, for instance. So now what we can do is we can take our data that we collected from 20 subjects in an fMRI doing this experiment and contrast what's going on in their brain 
when they're extending compassion versus when they're extending neutrality. And what we see is a pattern that looks like this. Uh, so we actually can see activity that seems to be increased, not only in the MPFC, but also in the nucleus accumbens, areas associated with identifying with another and possibly a good feeling. And we have more data to suggest that there is a good feeling involved, uh, which I won't go into today for a lack of time. We also see activation in the amygdala and anterior insula, uh, which may be related to some sort of empathetic process. Others have shown this, like John's essay. We also see, surprisingly to me, some activation in the SMA. Um, this is controlling for motor output. Uh, that's the supplementary motor area. Uh, we don't know if that's really related to a feeling of wishing to do something for someone else or not. This is another open question about compassion. To what extent is it active versus passive? So I'm just putting this up as one example of how you can break things down and try to reconstruct them, not only in terms of phenomenology, but also in terms of using neuroscience tools. About the people in the panel today, um, uh, many people refer to the fear of the unknown, but I also believe there's a fascination with the unknown. Um, and it drives many of us, scientists and inner explorers alike. Um, you're going to hear from uh, people who are pr probably driven by a fascination with the unknown because they are pushing the edge of knowledge, both in their field and creating new fields like cognitive, affective, social, and cultural, and even economic neuroscience. You're going to hear about, from representatives of all these fields, converging on the idea that we may be able to say something about compassion with the new tools that we have. So having said that, I'm not going to take any more time, uh, but I will introduce the next speaker.